I have every faith that Indiana Jones 5 will be good. I have every faith that Indiana Jones 5 will be good. I have every faith that Indiana Jones 5 will be good. Well, that was a mistake. Full spoilers ahead for Indiana Jones and the box office bomb. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was meant to be the swan song for good old Dr. Jones in 2008, except people didn't really like that one, and following the box office success of The Force Awakens, it seemed like a slam dunk to do the same thing for Indy. Now there's almost as many old indie movies as there are young indie movies. To be honest, I'm not really that disappointed because my optimism for the movie dried up quite a bit post that full fat video and pre the wide release. Khan not liking it is one thing, but when every geek website was criticising it and at best saying it's okay, you know you're in trouble. Geek sites rarely ever do that, even for the terrible movies in franchises, they have some faint praise for them, so this had all the makings of a real stinker. I went in with low expectations, and even then it was putting me to sleep. I commonly see people talk about the age that you see blockbusters dictating whether or not you like them, and whilst I think that is true to a certain extent, it infantilises people's ability to think critically about the things that they watch. Sure, I have an affinity for the Star Wars prequels and Crystal Skull, and I'm a 90s baby, but I can still accept that their movies rife with problems that don't live up to their predecessors. I don't enjoy them merely from the nostalgia angle, because there's plenty of films I saw at that same stage in life that I wouldn't praise now because I think they're bad movies. The problem with Dial of Destiny isn't that I've seen it in my mid-twenties, it's the bland direction, ho-hum screenwriting, and lack of genuine surprise and tension that makes it such a chore to sit through. I think I'd cover my ears if I were you. I also have to think, Crystal Skull was loved by all my contemporaries at the time in 2008, but I can't see a 12 year old sticking Dial of Destiny on repeat. It really is telling that in spite of the hate, Crystal Skull was a box office smash, whereas Dial is limping at the box office barely a week into release. I'm going to break down the movie and give you my full thoughts on what I think turned out to be a pretty huge misfire. But before I get to all that, I want to talk about today's sponsor, Private Internet Access, a VPN. A virtual private network, or VPN for short, hides your IP address and safeguards your internet connection through an encrypted tunnel, shielding your digital life from the eyes of those that are looking to exploit your private information. Using the internet without PIA is like using a public restroom with the door wide open. Everyone can see your private business. There are many websites and online services that are only available in certain regions. Netflix, Disney+, Plus, sports websites, and others often limit their libraries based on the viewer's location. Private internet access helps overcome these restrictions by allowing the option to change your IP address to any of the 84 countries or 50 states listed. Using private internet access allowed me to connect to Japan, which allowed me to then go to Netflix Japan, where I could watch Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, which is not available where I am. Best of all, private internet access is available for all platforms, so it doesn't matter whether you have a Mac or a Windows. They of course have a no logs policy, which means you can be satisfied that your data won't go anywhere. One subscription lets you protect an unlimited amount of devices at the same time. You can have your entire household logged in with your computer, laptops, iPads, smartphones, whatever. Just one subscription, which I think really sets this brand apart. Private Internet Access is kindly granting my viewers an 83% discount. That's just $2 a month. Plus you'll get an extra four months absolutely free. It's risk free. They offer a 30 day money back guarantee and 24 seven customer support. Check out my link in the description below for this deal. Thanks to Private Internet Access for sponsoring today's video. The previous movies. Before I go into my thoughts on Dial, here's my thoughts on the previous indie movies. This should provide some context for the people who are going to get unreasonably angry over my opinion on the movie, because they'll be able to berate me for my thoughts on the whole series. You chose... poorly. And when they see that I think Last Crusade is the best one, they can be satiated by the fact that their entire opinion on the franchise is really different to mine and I'm probably wrong about everything. But seriously, can we bring back film discourse to being about having different opinions on movies and disseminating how we feel about them and why? Rather than making everything vitriolic and nasty because another person's film taste doesn't exactly align with our own. You're embarrassing us. You know what I do when I hear someone likes Dial of Destiny? I don't have a meltdown, that's for sure. I just get on with my day. Anyway, the first three films are all masterpieces. Landmarks in action, adventure, timeless, aside from the age gap between Mary and Indy and the fact that the Indian government thought Temple of Doom was really offensive. It was wrong and you knew it! You knew what you were doing. Chilled a monkey brain. 
Raiders started it all. It's got perhaps the most iconic moments all within one indie adventure. It introduced us to so many key indie characters and staples. Temple of Doom has always been derided, even by Spielberg himself, but its place as the darkest Indiana Jones adventure is what makes it so awesome. And that minecart chase leading into the bridge sequence, my god, that's pure movie magic. <laughs> The Last Crusade is mostly on par with Raiders, but I think it has a stronger crescendo and a warmer emotional core with Indy and Henry Jones Sr. What are we talk about? We didn't talk. We never talked. It edges out as the best movie in the franchise for that very reason. Indiana. Let it go. And then Crystal Skull, I mean, you know I like that one. Definitely not as good as the first three, but certainly not the one star picture 2008 internet made it out to be. The fridge nuking is as silly as a bunch of other old indie logic leaps. Mutt Williams is a moody teenager, of course he's annoying. Yes, there's more of a reliance on CGI, but the action is still largely very good. It ends the series really well by giving Indy the thing he never chased after, a family. Seeing him marry the love of his life and form a bond with his estranged son doesn't get much more final than that. I was pretty happy leaving Indy, knowing that he had all those things. But going into Dial initially, I was hyped, genuinely. I knew that Harrison Ford cared about this character a lot, I like Phoebe Waller-Bridge, Fleabag video plug, and I've liked just about every James Mangold movie I've seen. Logan felt like an audition for this, and I thought everything he said about the approach to this movie sounded right. I was sceptical, sure, but I'm one of the few people who likes every Indiana Jones movie, so I was hoping I wouldn't have to start hating now. Mangold's biggest misfire. What I most like about Mangold is that he does do cape movies and franchise pictures, but he doesn't get lost down that route entirely. In between Logan and Dial, he made Ford vs Ferrari, and he's got a larger list of decent movies than most filmmakers thrown into the superhero machine after their first couple of films. A lot of other filmmakers have fallen into the franchise trap and never left, which is a bit of a shame if you ask me. But this film was just such a misfire, it's probably the only time I've watched a movie of his and not enjoyed it. Two films in his career make Dial even more baffling as a finished product, Logan and Night and Day. Night and Day has aged tremendously well, but I think it would have gone down better following the golden age of Ethan Hunt, whereas this was just before. It's much lighter in tone and has more rom-com DNA, but the action is certainly better and it's funnier than Dial to boot. I wouldn't say this is a better Indiana Jones movie or anything like that, but there is a scene that feels like Tom Cruise's audition for Uncharted. Wow, the recent Uncharted movie is better than Dial. Ouch. Oh, crap. It certainly has a better pace to its globetrotting plot, and it's simply got more of the fun that this movie is lacking. Boyd Holbrook was a memorable and fun baddie in Logan, in spite of the fact that he had a fairly one-note character. Well, in Dial, he's absolutely wasted. The dude doesn't even get a good one-liner or anything to work with. You could have replaced him with absolutely anybody off the street, and you wouldn't know the difference. It's crazy that Mangold was able to work with complex themes or deliver on fun spectacle in those previous movies, and couldn't create even a poor man's version of either of those films here. You have to wonder what studio meddling went on to make this as safe and sanitised as possible, because I still think Mangold is a decent enough filmmaker that a movie like Dial shouldn't have happened on his watch. This is the man that tried to give us an R-rated spaghetti western Boba Fett movie right after Logan. How did we get here instead? The Polar Express flashback. Right off the bat I knew we were in trouble because the de-aging effect to create middle-aged original recipe indie is just horrendous. The film successfully managed to make me time travel to 2004 because I felt like I was watching the Polar Express. A lot of this film actually feels like it was directed by late stage Zemeckis. I was mostly baffled by the de-aging here because I've seen it done better dating back to almost a decade ago now. Michael Douglas in Ant-Man was the first time I was genuinely impressed by de-aging and again with Kurt Russell in Guardians 2. In both instances it felt like the actors weren't buried by the special effects. For two very short scenes I bought that we were looking at their younger selves. In that time, Lucasfilm has recreated several youthful faces, or even actors that have passed away, to almost exclusively disastrous results. I think the most you can pull off with this stuff is touching up an actor's performance and de-aging them just enough without breaking the rubber band. Having an 80 year old fooled and various body doubles contribute to a CGI render of Indiana Jones for an entire opening action set piece simply does not work. 
Time after time, we're shown complex visual effects trying to capture the magic of real life icons, and time after time it is proven that you cannot replicate them through a computer, no matter how talented the VFX artists are. There's a moment where Indy grins, holds up his hat, and knocks out Mads Mikkelsen. When the Uncanny Valley CGI Indy did that, all I thought about was how awesome that would have looked in 1989 with the real Harrison Ford doing it. Unfortunately, we can't time travel back to 1989, and so if we can't do that, we should just accept that trying to approximate it just isn't the same. The death of Mutt Williams. So I was researching a Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol video, and I got a great quote from Chris McQuarrie. Michelle Monaghan was dead, Julia's character was really dead. I came on board and I said, look, there are two things going on. One, emotionally, if Julia's dead, no matter how this story turns out, I'm sad. A hundred means you're at 90, because no matter how well Ethan wins, he's carrying this failure that you've alluded to the entire movie. You've got to let the audience off the hook tonally in Brad Bird's Mission Impossible. That feeling Macquarie describes is exactly what ends up happening in Dial of Destiny. You're meant to get hyped for this whole adventure, but you've opened on depressed, lonely old man Indy, mourning the loss of his only child who died before him. His wife is gone. Everything that he had at the end of Crystal Skull is null and void. Marion's divorce only serves to create weak, contrived drama for Indy to have resolved at the end of the movie. However you feel about Mutt Williams as a character, the decision to kill him off is a poor one because it's entirely about the metatextual response from the audience and not about what best serves the story. Pucci died on the way back to his home planet. The character has been hastily written out to appease 2008 fanboy Rage in the hopes that those same fans will be more lenient now he's dead and gone. But in the context of the indie universe, it's just utterly miserable for misery's sake. Indy didn't need to lose his only son for some cheap character drama, and neither of them deserved that after the adventure they went on in Skull. Creed, a much better legacy sequel, didn't kill off Rocky's son because he wasn't conducive to the story. They just wrote him out. He's off upstate with his wife and kids. He's happy, we're just not seeing it. And then in Creed 2, he makes a brief cameo as Rocky reconnects with him. So far, that's the last image of Rocky Balboa we have. Him greeting his son and grandson. The character being surrounded by love and family. What's Indy's final lasting image? Henry and Marion mourning the loss of their son who died before his time? It's so ludicrously unnecessary for such a light adventure series. Ford is finally too old. Ford is way too old in this one. The bad guys slap him up and it's just kind of sad. It's not very entertaining watching them slap up this OAP who can barely run. In every film, Indy fights a guy twice his size with some fisticuffs. In Dial, the heavy on the bad guys team smacks him and he just sits back in his seat. What can he do? Later, the child sidekick offs the heavy in a brief underwater sequence. No Indy versus the heavy fight in this one, kids. Dr. Jones is going to need a hip replacement. In the lead up to the movie, Mangold said the previous drafts of the script prior to his involvement never addressed Jones's age. We've seen him tackle a hero at sunset in Logan, and he used the fact the title character was aging and out of step to great effect. In spite of saying he wanted his film to really tackle that in a way Crystal Skull did not, the movie doesn't really dig into any of this either. It still wants you to get the old indie feel. It still wants you to revel in the action as it pulls off death-defying stunts, partakes in car chases, and outruns trains on horseback. Sanitized. I don't think you can really make sequels to films from 40 years ago anyway. Things you could get away from kids' movies then, you absolutely could not now. I'm not even sure I can show things like Alfred Molina skewered like a kebab in Raiders, because it might get me demonetized. And that movie was a PG. You couldn't release any of the old indies without them being at least R-rated now. So going into Dial of Destiny, you know from the outset, nothing is going to be as dark and as awesome as watching Nazis get their face melted, or watching Indy get possessed straight out of a horror movie, or hell, seeing a guy get consumed by bloodthirsty ants. All of the spectacle is going to be much safer. The movie still wants Nazis to be the bad guys, but it doesn't have the balls to melt their faces off anymore. They simply crash their plane. A pretty painless and quick death, all things considered. The optics of this movie are so off anyway. Disney likes to champion its efforts in creating more diverse heroes and admirable effort, but then it quickly kills off the only prominent black woman in this indie movie who's been working alongside Nazis the whole time. The conflict with Mason, being that she works for the US government and so has to align with Mads Mikkelsen and co because they are also employed by the state, having worked on the space race, is a fascinating conflict for her to deal with. 
This is a juicier bit of drama than anything Indy and Helena have to deal with, and yet she's quickly killed off when the script has no use for her. For a company that claims to be really progressive, it leaves its only black female character completely unserviced in this movie. And then there's things like, you know, this low fat critique of capitalism. You stole it. Then you stole it. And then I stole it. It's called capitalism. I, I even really like Phoebe Waller-Bridge. It's not the problem here. Fleabag is one of the best shows to come out of my tiny island in a long time. But it's kind of painfully ironic to hear her saying this when she was born into the kind of wealth that only occurs through family generations benefiting from capitalism. I find these kinds of jabs in big budget movies produced by profit hungry corporations, read out by people born into great means, really quite condescending and hypocritical. Whether you are capitalist or anti-capitalist, you have to see that Disney really has no business slipping in these jabs when they are willing to do plenty of immoral things to make money. Independent cinema is the space to critique capitalism, nepo babies, mass inequality and all kinds of hot topics, but huge blockbusters created by corporations will do the bare minimum in terms of representation, they'll put these kind of jokes in without really having anything to say, and then they'll go and underpay a bunch of VFX artists and threaten to blacklist post houses. It is insane how much Disney is allowed to get away with. This movie is incredibly safe. Even the time travel element, something that seems like a ludicrous big swing akin to the presence of aliens, doesn't really do anything interesting with it. I thought that maybe the Polar Express flashback would in fact not be a flashback, but a sequence where the leads find themselves in that time period and that actually the trailers were lying to us. I mean, that wouldn't have been much better, but at least it would have been a surprise. I think the direction is really missing Spielberg. He would have made a more entertaining movie out of the lackluster script with more exciting camera work and more practical stunts. J.J. Abrams, for all of his faults, can do a pretty decent Spielberg approximation. Even in his worst films like The Rise of Skywalker, you can see that he's trying to do that Spielberg style of an inventive one -er, moving from one shot to another. I don't think Dial is anywhere near as offensive as Rise of Skywalker, but Abrams could have been a better fit for this movie. Discount Spielberg would have made for a better indie movie than no Spielberg vibes at all. Spielberg really injected a goofy fun to the action that was rooted in crazy coincidences, sheer luck and Buster Keaton-esque hijinks. Indy would grab his hat under a door just in time, or Mutt would break and Indy would be sent flying onto the back of his motorbike. You see Indy swing from the rafters with his whip only to miss the target truck entirely and smash into the next vehicle in a purposely goofy fashion. Damn, I thought that was closer. <coughs> That's what's fun about the spectacle in Indiana Jones. It's silly. Now the action in Dial is silly, it feels very modern and ends up feeling really quite boring. Again, you know, the motorcycle chasing Crystal Skull has a moment where Indy falls into the bad guy's car and then hops back on Mutt's bike, skidding along the road. They then end up drifting through a library, narrowly missing all the tables and knocking out all the chairs underneath. As they recover, a student, Chet Hanks? Oh my god, that's Chet Hanks! Internet gone mad! Respect, you're done now. Fuck off. Asks Dr. Jones for help with his paper, then they ride off. You might dislike the aliens or the, or the fridge nuking, but the scene has more DNA of the original three films than Dial does for its entirety. A lot of people consider Crystal Skull the black sheep of the family, but it still has that Spielberg feel, and I think with the release of this bastardised Jones adventure, the fourth instalment now seems like it's far more in tune with what came before. Fasten your seatbelt. There might be some tablets. Why do legacy sequels like Top Gun Maverick and Creed soar both critically and commercially, where a movie like Dial suffers? I think the trick is that people are excited to see those movies because of the action that was taking place in the now, rather than being invested in conjuring up old feelings and nostalgia. Those movies feel like things you could get excited for without the brand association. If I saw a fighter pilot movie starring Tom Cruise or a boxing movie trailer starring Michael B. Jordan that looked like Maverick or Creed, I'd go and see it. I don't really care about the first Top Gun, but I saw Maverick four times in the cinema. There really is nothing that can be a good story that's well told. With so many blockbusters struggling this year, the ongoing writer's strike, and so many cases of VFX artists being treated unfairly, I think Hollywood is at a real tipping point. Disney's tactic to make solely big budget movies changed the landscape of filmmaking, but now the big studios need to realise that mid budget movies existed for a reason. Audiences are becoming aware that all these massive projects are safe and won't challenge us. Studios are starting to realise when you stake all your profits on blockbusters, the failures will be equally as huge when they start to collapse. Streaming wasn't the next stage of TV like it was touted as. Instead, it's killed the ability for films to get a second wind in physical sales. It's killed the sanctity of going to the multiplex by trying to convince people you can get the same experience at home. 
I think we're going to see more films and streamers become casualties of the current climate, but hopefully in the next few years the powers that be will be forced to take genuine risks, tell exciting stories and shock the audience back into rushing to the cinema. The audience has lost a lot of faith in the movies, and as a lifelong fan of the cinema, it is truly sad to see. Things have changed so much in the last 10 years, it's not just mid-budget dramas that have been banished from the big screen, even studio comedies struggle to get made. The cinema can't just be filled with superheroes, animated kids movies, and nostalgic callbacks to yesteryear. We need fresh ideas, original screenplays, things that demand to be seen on the big screen. Dial of Destiny, unfortunately, is not it. A big thank you to my full fat tier patron, Dr. Chike, and Nathan Shaw. If you'd like to donate money to my Patreon, you can find me at patreon.com slash fullfatvideos. If you'd like to find me on Instagram, you can find me at full underscore fat underscore videos. And if you'd like to find me on Twitter, you can find me at, at fullfatvideos.